um, displayed in a QA and a format just about how you started the business, where you think you're heading and any advice that you might have to fellow entrepreneurs wanting to get into crypto or just their own business. Sure. Awesome. Uh, so let's kick off with a little, little personal info. You're based in Brisbane. Did you grow up in the area? No, no. I've been in Brisbane only five years now, six years. Nice. So, yeah. I grew up all over New South Wales. My parents were school teachers, so they moved around every two or three years ah, uh, for bigger and better contracts. And I actually lived in Bali for a couple of years after, um, I, I think I was on the Sunshine Coast for about 15 years. So. Yeah, right. Whereabouts in Bali? Were you? In Sunua. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, it's on the east coast. It's away from the nightclubs. Beautiful little <laughs> fishing village. I could go down, to, walk down to the beach every morning and meditate and watch the sunrise. And, Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and how did you get started with your business? With the crypto business? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I started out, my first job was financial planning uh, back in 92. That was my first job when I, when I left university. And um, I learned a lot. I, I actually started six financial planning businesses and I've, I've been in the field for, for a long time. And I'm, I'm one of those kids who, you know, when, when my dad gave me an alarm clock, I pulled it apart to find out how it worked. And when mum's toaster broke, I pulled it apart to find out why it wasn't working. And when I got into financial planning, I just liked to pull things apart. And a lot of it obviously was managed funds. And I'd sort of pull those apart and find out, you know, why this stock was going up and that one was going down. And I found educating my clients was was a great way of getting them to make smarter decisions rather than coming in and saying, what should I do? What should I do? I could actually educate them and then they'd know what to do at what particular time. And I, I first got into crypto. A few of my mates got in uh, back in 2012 and that was the very early days. And these were sort of like geeky guys operating on the fringe. And I sort of looked at it and went, I don't understand it. I've heard rumours about Silk Road and drug deals and things like that. Um, it's not really for me. And I, I sort of let it go. And then a few years later, somebody actually made a, like a, a YouTube documentary about Bitcoin, just explaining what it is and what it does. And one of my friends who was an early adopter, he called me and said, hey, come and watch this documentary with us. And so I went around, there was probably about 10 of us and went and watched this documentary. And I went, oh, I actually get it now. It's gold that you can email to other people. And that's what it is. And at the time in my business, like we had staff in Fiji, Philippines, Indonesia, Africa, we were sending money to different people and it was costing us a lot in bank fees and transfer fees and Western Union, that sort of stuff. So I thought, I'll get some of this Bitcoin <clears throat> and I can actually pay our staff with it. So I, I looked at it just as a transactional currency. Um, I didn't realise at the time that it was a store of value or that other people would actually see it as a store of value. And, of course, it started to go up because other people thought, you know, rather than paying $39 to transfer funds to another country, I can pay about five cents. And other people started getting interested and then the price took off, as, as you know, like 2000 when was that 2016-ish mm -hmm. um, and we'd actually been thinking ahead and going okay rather than buying a hundred dollars worth of bitcoin sending it to this person about 100 we, we would buy like 500 or a thousand dollars worth of bitcoin knowing we were going to use it in the next few months mm -hmm. and by the time i sort of bought like a thousand dollars worth of bitcoin and sent you know 200 to this person and 200 to that person and 100 dollars for that person there was still money left like how is this how is this even possible because I hadn't realised the, the scarce nature of it. And, of course, there was a few other crypto projects that were coming out at the time um, with Ethereum and a, a few other projects. And I looked at them the same way that I looked at, at picking stocks and going, OK, who's behind this project? What experience do they have? What problems does it solve? And we started investing. And um, I started investing and my partner got interested in investing when, when she saw me making money. And... Um, then a few other people contacted me, um, mates of mine who are financial planners and accountants and things like that, saying, hey, I've heard that you're making money out of crypto. How do you do that? And I started to tell them and then realised I need to leverage this and I created a, a not-for-profit site um, where I just put all the information down so people could go and learn so I didn't have to take up all my time with meetings. Mm -hmm. And then 
uh, one of the financial planners and one of the accountants actually said, like, this is all great information. We know how to do it, but we don't have time. We're too busy in our businesses. So can you do it for us? And I was like, oh, my God. You know, like I'm, I'm comfortable investing my money <clears throat> or my partner's money because obviously she knows where I live. Um, and if I lose my own money, it's my own silly fault. But investing on behalf of other people, I thought, okay, I'm only going to do that if I can set up a, a proper legal structure and set up like a managed fund. So we went to the accountant and said, we want to set up a, a managed fund, a unit trust. And the accountant said, oh, what are you doing that for? And I said, oh, because we're going to invest in cryptocurrency and pool it for people. And the accountant said, oh, yeah, I'll throw 10 grand in. I'm not sure how many accountants you know, Ronell, but um, usually accountants never invest in anything. So I thought, okay, we've, we've got something here. And it, it started to grow and people talked about it. The only issue we had, of course, it was Facebook wouldn't allow crypto ads, Google, YouTube, LinkedIn, no one allowed crypto ads. So we just had to build it from, from word of mouth. And we've been going for, for six years now. And I think Facebook has just allowed us to start doing ads now after we've been running for six years. Gosh, goodness. So what year was it that the biz business was officially founded? Uh, well, we, we started the, like the beta version of the fund in 2016 and just tested it on a few private individuals. And then we actually launched it to the public in January 2018. Fantastic. And um, take it back as if I'm a lay person and I've never come across your business. Mm -hmm. How would you describe what it is that your business does? I think most people are familiar with, with managed funds or mutual funds uh, because a lot of people have got superannuation or that's the first way that you got into stocks. And they know it's a safer way to let the expert look after it. And obviously, if one stock goes down and the other one goes up, then it all balances out in the end. So that's basically what we're doing with, with Boston Coin, and we call it the coin of coins. So it's a basket of different uh, crypto projects and also technology stocks. One, one of the interesting ones we were looking at is you know, comparing, again, crypto projects to, to stocks and saying, okay, MySpace used to be a big deal. You know, Nokia used to be a big deal. But then someone comes out of left field and Facebook and Apple just cut their lunch and take away the business. So we decided to invest in the infrastructure. So I don't know if Bitcoin's going to be around in the next few years or someone better is going to come along. But if we own the fiber optic cables that the network runs on, then we're still going to make money regardless of whoever wins the race. And the interesting thing is like investing into those fiber optic cables. And then, of course, the pandemic happened and a lot of people started working from home, which obviously using the fiber optic cables for Zoom calls and things like that. And the people who couldn't work from home were sitting back and watching Netflix, which meant obviously the fiber optic cables traffic went through the roof. So at the start of the pandemic, when Bitcoin went down by 60%, the Boston coin portfolio went up by 50% because we were diversified into other things. Fantastic. It's really interesting. Um, would you say the pandemic has then helped the business uh, get to where it is now quicker or... I think a lot of people, you know, faced with sitting at home and it, it sort of happened at the, perf the perfect storm because a lot of people were curious about um, cryptocurrency and when they had less time at work and more time at home, they could actually jump on Google and things like that and start to ask questions. And you know, we, we created a lot of blog sites and videos. We did interviews with CEOs of different crypto projects so we could provide an education to people. And, you know, at the end of the day, some people want to do it themselves that's okay. We'll teach them how to do it themselves. That's why we set up trillionaire.com. That other people want someone to do it for them. And that's that's perfectly okay. Not everyone changes their own oil or mows their own lawn. Some people do. But the people who want someone else to do it, we've got that covered. Yeah, great. And what are some of the biggest highlights that you've had in the last six years of business? I think um, still being here <laughs> because cryptocurrency was obviously very new and very problematic at the start and having to set up different wallets and get verified and find exchanges and things like that. Avoiding all of the, the scams. Uh, I think Cointelegraph said 92.5% of crypto projects that started off were scams. Uh, so we managed to avoid all of those by just following our four-step procedure um, and making sure there was a real person behind the project checking that person on LinkedIn profiles and social medias to make sure they really existed and were working on the project, making sure the project actually 
does things and provides solutions to a problem. Um, some of our earlier investments, I think I, I emailed you through, uh, we got into Celsius in 2019. Um, we got into Secret, Solana, uh, CRO, which is crypto.com, um, like years before anybody else did. And obviously crypto.com has just come out and bought the Staples Stadium or sponsored the Staples Stadium. They've done the ads with um, Matt Damon. You know, they're, they're spending billions of dollars to be front and centre. And we bought into this thing when it was seven cents and then it went up to like the dollar 25. Um, so just by, by doing our fundamental analysis and looking at the projects that are going to be around for the long haul, we've done exceptionally well. And, you know, every fund manager would love to say we bought something that went up a thousand percent or 10,000 percent. Well, we've got at the moment four or five of our coins that we've bought into that have exceeded 10,000 percent. So. Wow. Hectic. And how many work in the business full time at the moment? Uh, full time is myself. Um, we've got our, our legal advisor who comes in when needed. And I've got my um, admin team in, in Indonesia. Amazing. And how many are in the admin team? So if I was to say Boston Coin now now is scaled to a team of X people, how many? Yeah, that? Um, it's, it's really it's. It's surprisingly small. Like we, we've got maybe six people working on any one day, um, and you know, a couple of people answering the phones as needed. So, but everybody's working from home. So we've kept the overheads very low, and that's fine. Um, I mean, I started working from home in 2010, so way before it was cool, because I, I used to rent an office, a financial planning office, in the main street of the Sunshine Coast. And in the 12 months that I leased that office, we had two customers who came in through the front door. Mm-hmm. And all the rest of the time, people were like, oh, can you come and visit me at work because I can't get away from work? Can you come and see me after hours at home? So most of the stuff was done you know, in cafes, people's homes or people's places of business. And I didn't really need to have that office there. So, yeah, I've been working from home for more than 10 years and obviously worked from Bali for a couple of years, which was great. So just have a laptop and a mobile phone and you've got your office. Nice. And what has been the biggest failure in the business or biggest lesson you've learned? Hmm. Um, I think the the biggest handicap was having the crypto bans. Um, I don't think we've had any any failures, but um, the the handicap, the challenge was having those crypto bans and, and Facebook and the social media places didn't really distinguish between, oh, there's two blokes in a garage who just made up a, a crap coin last Tuesday because they were trying to rip people off. And here's a business that's been running for years and years and years and doing it successfully. So it has been a, a challenge in that regard. And obviously, you know, we're one of, I think, five competitors in the space now, but no one's got our track record. No one's got, no one can show you what they've done over the last five years. No one can show you how they've outperformed Bitcoin over the last couple of years. So mm-hmm. we've got first mover advantage um, and possibly, you know, the, the handicap that we couldn't advertise, um, we just spent more money on growing the business and rewarding the people who, who shared the, the knowledge with their friends rather than giving money to Facebook or YouTube or whoever for ads. So... Interesting. Do you do some sort of referral system or how is it that you're finding so many customers? Yeah, when, when Facebook brought in the the, um, the bands, we couldn't create an ad, but I could write whatever I liked on my own page. Mm-hmm. And if people liked it or shared it, that was up to them. So um, 2017, I actually said to a few people, if you share my post on your page, I'll give you $5 worth of Bitcoin. And a few people did and a few people shared it a few times and one girl got $30 worth of Bitcoin and one girl got $10 worth of Bitcoin. And obviously over time, you know, that $30 worth of Bitcoin has become several hundred now <laughs> so just from, you know, social, social sharing and things like that. But, um, yeah, I, I feel it's better off in, in the person's hand than giving it to a large faceless corporation. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't need the money, but probably, you know, friends and family do. Mm. So. Absolutely. And what advice would you have to any aspiring entrepreneurs wanting to start their own business? Well, this is my 13th startup, I think. I've I've stopped counting, but (laughs) I've had a lot. Uh, It might be my 14th startup. And I I would suggest do what you really, really love to do. Um, You possibly can make more money by doing something difficult or challenging. But every now and then there's going to be something. There's going to be you know, a pandemic which comes out of left field. There's going to be a day when you're not feeling well. You're going to have an argument with friends or family or whatever. 
And on the days when you just don't feel like doing it, obviously, if you love doing it, you're going to continue to do it. And in, in my different businesses, in my financial planning businesses, in my crypto business, even in my retail businesses, there were some days when, you know, tragic events happen. You ran over the cat or your partner got sick and taken to hospital or whatever. If you really, really love what you do, you're going to continue doing it. And maybe you'll get to the stage where you don't love it anymore. And that's a time when you can say, okay, I'll sell this business to someone who does, who loves doing it, and then I'll go and pursue my other passion project. And that's fine as well. I mean, you, you create a business to give you the lifestyle, but the moment that you don't like it anymore, you can actually sell it to someone else as a going concern and go and do something else that you do love. Yeah, fantastic. And lastly, um, any plans for the future of the business? Anything big happening in the next 12, 18 months? Uh, well, yeah, we've, we've had Boston Coin, as I say, for the last six years, and it's, it's basically like it's the middle of the road, um, kind of compared to a balanced fund, if, if you want, for the mutual funds and the managed funds. Um, in, in the next couple of months, we're actually creating new structures because at the moment we can have individual investors because they do the KYC with their wallet and their passport and driver's licence. But it's very difficult to get people who have got self-managed super funds and 401ks. So we're setting up structures in the US and in Australia where the retirement fund can actually buy um, like a unit in the unit trust. And then the unit trust actually buys the cryptocurrency on their behalf. So it's just making it so much easier for people with self-managed super funds and 401ks to actually invest into the Boston coin. And then for people who are on the other side of retirement and just looking for a regular monthly income, uh, we're actually launching two new funds. One, the Polycoin is um, just basically stable coins, Hong Kong dollar, US dollar, Australian dollar, which will pay around about five or six percent just on an ongoing basis. So it doesn't doesn't fluctuate, doesn't go up and down. But for those people who need the income, obviously, you can get five to six percent income which is significantly better than what the bank will pay you on term deposits or even government bonds. And then our dark coin, which is going to be the high risk, high return fund. So we've got the medium and the medium has been running very well. So now we're going to have a sort of lower risk one for grandma and a higher risk one for the millennials who just like, oh yeah, I'll throw some money in there. And it might make 10,000% or it might, might go to nothing. So we, we've been running those again in beta mode before bringing them to the market. And in the last 12 months, the fir first nine months, the Dart coin did 24,000% in nine months. Uh, then it crashed because it's volatile um, mm -hmm. and went down by about half. So over 12 months, the Dart coin only returned around about 11,000%. My goodness. So, but yeah, that's, that's a highly volatile one. We, we haven't been marketing that one to the general public. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you tell people you can make 10,000% in a year, they just go, oh, it's too scary, it's too risky, I don't know what it is. Um, but with the Boston coin, obviously, we can say, yeah, we made 577% in the last 12 months, and people go, mm -hmm. oh, well, that's a lot. Is it risky? You say, well, it's actually less risky than Bitcoin, and we can show them on the chart how we've outperformed Bitcoin and we have less volatility than Bitcoin. And when, when they understand that, we can compare Boston coin to Bitcoin, and they go, oh, cool, I get it. Here's my money. Yeah, it's really interesting. And what's the minimum buy-in for Boston Coin? At, at the moment, the minimum buy-in is $1,000. Okay. And that's primarily because obviously, you know, if you drop $1,000 in, we've got to buy a bit of this coin, a bit of that coin, a bit of something else. So there's a lot of transfer fees in the initial setup. Yeah. Um, going forward, um, as I say, we're, we're creating these new structures. We're also looking to apply for an AFSL, okay. uh, Financial Services Licence. Mm -hmm in Australia and in the US. So that will increase our costs and we may have to increase the minimum up to 10,000 as a minimum. But yeah, we don't know about that yet because we're just setting up these structures now. Yeah, of course. And so is there any um, fees similar to, you know, a brokerage fee for ETFs or anything along yeah. those lines? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's funnily enough, because my background is obviously in financial planning and, and managed funds. So we set it up similar to that where it charges 2% per year, which is a common enough Very management common. expenses ratio. You know, most funds are about 1.52% per year. Um, interestingly, again, without bagging the competitors, but uh, a couple of the competitors set theirs up with like 20 or 30% fees, uh, what they call outperformance. So if the fund does 100%, they take 30% and give you 70. 
Um, and I thought, oh, gee, I wish I had known about that. We could have been paying ourselves a lot more money. Uh, but that's fine. That's fine. Maybe we'll do something like that with the with the new fund, the one that that shoots the lights out. Um, because you, you won't mind paying 20% if you've made 10,000%. But mm -hmm. on, a, on a, you know, sort of meaty, meaty middle of the road kind of fund, mm -hmm. um, we didn't see the need to put in a huge fee um, and we didn't. And that's just, it's carved in stone now, so we can't change it. Yeah, interesting. Do you think uh, there's a bit of a trend for passive investing in ETFs? Why would I pick a Boston coin, um, Boston coin over just doing my own ETFs through Vanguard or... Etc. Yeah, obviously, like the the vanguards and those sort of things. Uh, I had a look at this the other day because obviously the GFC shook people up for a little while. And if you'd invested ten thousand dollars in the ASX two hundred in two thousand and seven, right now, fourteen years later, you would have around about twelve thousand dollars, around about twenty percent growth over fourteen years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stuff all. <clears throat> Um, and if you'd invested $10,000 in the S&P 500 in the US market in 2007, after 14 years, you'd have around about 14,000. So slightly better, 40% growth, but over 14 years, that's pretty boring, obviously. And now we've got the ability to have the technology stocks and the crypto funds and things like that. And we're seeing, you know, PayPal is allowing customers to get crypto. Commonwealth Bank of Australia is allowing customers to get crypto. There's big institutions and billionaires and fund managers, JP Morgan and this sort of stuff, Bank of America, who are actually getting into it now, realising it's a juggernaut and either they get on board or they get left behind. So, yeah, people want to invest safely and securely. We'll either teach them how to do it or we'll actually do it for them. Yeah, nice. Um, and then just lastly, more out of my own curiosity, um, what are your thoughts on Treasurer Frydenberg's plan to sort of shake up the payment system and do some work around crypto? Uh, with There's a, a lot of countries who are looking into central bank digital currencies mm -hmm. and there's not going to be much of a change from the consumer's point of view because a lot of us now are used to sort of tapping your phone or tapping your card. We don't actually handle physical cash so much. Um, so the central bank digital currencies can be issued pretty easily. From my point of view, like completely pragmatic, if, if I was the government, I wouldn't want to go to the expense of, of using plastic or paper and printing out notes. And then you've got to put them in a van and then you've got to get security yards and then you've got to ship them off to the bank and someone's got to count them and that sort of stuff. It's logistically, it's a nightmare, really. Uh, it's far easier for me to just email you the money onto your phone or onto your computer and you can tap and go. So logistically, I think it's going to be a huge saving for the government, which is number one, why they would want to bring it in. Um, there are some unconfirmed rumours and conspiracy theories. You know, Julian Assange and, and these kind of guys are saying it's government surveillance disguised as a currency uh, because the, the cryptocurrency can be programmed. And we probably shouldn't even call it a cryptocurrency because central bank digital currencies yeah. are not public. Um, they're private, they're centralised, they can be controlled and manipulated, which you know, Bitcoin can't be controlled by a government. China can ban it, but that's OK. It still goes on in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And there's still people in China who can use a VPN to connect to the internet and they can still buy it. The government can't stop it. So the government's going to come out. And for my money, this is just my personal opinion, I would suggest that the government would be crazy if they didn't provide stimulus checks and things like that. Like when El Salvador adopted the Bitcoin standard as a currency, they said, OK, download this Bitcoin wallet. We'll give you $30 worth of free Bitcoin for everybody in the country. And thirty dollars in El Salvador is a lot of money. Right? It's a lot more than a than a lunch. Um, so sixty six percent of the country downloaded the new wallet and got the new currency. So I would suggest that if the governments, the US, UK, Australia, want to have central bank di digital currencies, they'll do something similar. They'll say, okay, download this wallet and we'll give you your next stimulus check for the COVID. Or if you get vaccinated, we'll give you five hundred dollars. Or you know, everybody who's on the welfare system, DHS or whatever, you know, pensioners, you're going to be now paid through this new currency. Mm -hmm. And the people who have got no other choice will be forced to use the system. There'll be some other people who will prefer to use quasi anonymous currencies such as Bitcoin and Solana and Ethereum and that sort of stuff. Uh, because they don't want the government watching where they go and what they spend it on. So, again, yeah. my opinion, 
not that. It'll be interesting. Very interesting to watch it all unfold. Yeah. But also it's not, there's not much supposed to be happening until about May and there's got to be a, a federal election by May. So I guess we'll, we'll see. Well, you, you've seen what's happened in China, of course, with the central bank digital currency there. Yes. You know, if, you, if you go through a red light, they've got your face on traffic camera, they can take $50 out of your, out of your wallet. They see you littering on the street, they can take money out of your wallet. Yeah. And I'm not sure that people in Australia would be so happy to adopt a sort of system where the government can take your money without asking you. No. Well, um, yeah, it'll be interesting. We'll see what happens, I guess. It'll mm. be good. <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you, Jeremy. This was great. Um, if I'm cov- uh, Crypto is not super specifically my area, but I do do a little bit of it in the investing context. So if I have anything come up, are you happy to be contacted for comment um, if there's certain government media releases or things related to yeah, crypto changes? Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've spent 29 years in macroeconomics talking about, you know, how the government affects this and, and you know, mm-hmm. whether it's a property cycle or a, or a share cycle or whatever. Um, so crypto is a, a small subsection of the wider economic world. It's growing very, very fast. Um, but it's it's still affected by what's going on in the world. So when when the US government decides to print another three trillion dollars and increase the debt ceiling, that does affect crypto rather mm-hmm. than the other way around. So I'm I'm happy to comment on any sort of macroeconomic events that you have. Fantastic. I think it's always good if you can get an expert in um, as a bit of an explainer for these sort of things happening, which is great. Um, now remind me, do I have a photo of you already? Um, I think I sent it through on email. I know we've had about six emails. Yeah, um, it was it was an incredibly popular call out, unsurprisingly, um, and I've just been flooded, which yeah. has been great. Um, if if it's not there, um, yeah, just shoot me a message and I can I can send you one. Otherwise, you know what I look like now. You can just search me. <laughs> Will do. I think that'll be great. Um, now I'm not too sure when this is going to go up, but theoretically, it'll either be end of this week or mid next week. Mm-hmm. Um, but whenever it does go up, I will shoot you across the link so you can see it. Sweet, man. I'll share it all around our networks for you. Lovely. That's great. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thanks Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Cheers. Cool. Bye. Bye.